Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to call to order the Transportation and Infrastructure Subcommittee. Uh, most of our <clears throat> items today are for information and discussion. And um, does anyone have any questions on two? That's an information only. It's on uh, MAG, Metro, and the others. I think you get the reports telling you uh, what's been transpiring there. In case you have any questions, this is a good time to ask. Hearing done, we will go to items. Item three, which is Catherine, which is wastewater treatment plants renewal program. I think the word renewal is interesting. <laughs> And everyone's at the table but Catherine. <laughs> She's going to have to explain that. <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chairman, members of the subcommittee. We are here today to talk about renewal of our wastewater treatment plants. And I am here to introduce in Assistant Water Services Director Ron Serio. Take it away. Thank you, Karen. Good afternoon. Chairwoman Williams, members of the subcommittee, uh, we're here today to talk about the infrastructural, infrastructure renewal program at our wastewater treatment plants. I'm going to introduce Patty Kennedy, who's going to walk us through <laughs> the actual presentation. Okay. Wait, I have <laughs> yeah. you need to get somebody in that fourth chair. Yeah. Um, Patty is one of our deputy directors. She's responsible for the wastewater engineering division. Her and her team are responsible for the entire wastewater capital program, from planning all the way to designing and building, getting it operational, and turning it over to our operations staff. Patty? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to be here to talk about our renewal system. Um, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about our wastewater treatment plants. So we have three wastewater treatment plants. Our largest plant is the 91st Avenue plant. It has a capacity of 230 million gallons a day. The average day is um, the average flow is 140 million gallons a day, and this plant is jointly owned by Shrog, which is our subregional operating group, and it consists of um, we have four Shrog partners: Glendale, Mesa, Scottsdale, and Tempe. Our next largest plant is our 23rd Avenue plant. It has a capacity of 63 million gallons a day and an average flow of 31 million gallons a day. And then we also have Cave Creek Water Reclamation Plant. And it has a capacity of 8 million gallons a day. And it is currently offline as part of a cost-sharing measure. So now I'll give you a little um, information on where our plants are located. The Cave Creek plant is up in the Northeast Valley. Um, and like I said, it's, it's currently offline. The 23rd Avenue plant is fairly centrally located, South Central Phoenix on the Durango curve. It um, has, it, its um, flow area is the area in blue. So it services the entire area in blue. And then the 91st Avenue plant is located in the Southwest Valley and it services the area in um, salmon. I guess that's what color that is, salmon. <laughs> so it services salmon. Um, a little bit about the plants. The 23rd Avenue plant was first brought online in the early 30s. The 91st Avenue plant was brought online in the early 50s. And Cave Creek was brought online in the 90s. So in some cases, like at 23rd Avenue, we're dealing with um, some equipment and technology from the 30s. And to give you a little perspective now, the, um, there, the three treatment plants are capable of treating 301 million gallons a day. And so um, to give you a, a visual perspective of that, if you think of Tempe Town Lake, which is over two miles long, stretching from Hardy to McClintock, and has an average depth of about 13 um, feet, to fill Tempe Town Lake, it would take about three days. So that's how much flow capacity we could treat at our three plants. When we relate this back to our business plan, one of our goals in the Water Department is to ensure reliable infrastructure performance. And we do this through public, um, public health and safety by, rem by treating our wastewater. Um, we also want to treat it to high discharge standards, and we want to be able to reuse that effluent. So when we look at the goals of our renewal program, one of the main goals is to extend the useful life of the wastewater treatment plant. 
and, um, and the system. So we want to be able to say, is this piece of equipment ready to just be tossed out and, and, um, and a new one brought in? Or is there something we can do to that particular piece of equipment to renew the life? We also want to do that to optimize our capital spending. So again, do we just want to toss a piece of equipment and bring in a new one, or do we want to try and, and renew it and put off the capital expense for another couple of years? And we do that, that through asset identification. Each of, our, each of our plants, all the piece of equipment have asset ID tags, and so we're able to track operation and maintenance on, those, on each piece of asset. So when we look at our, um, our renewal program and the number of assets at each plant, at 91st Avenue, we have over 16,000 assets. And an asset can be anything from a pump, a motor, an actuator, any sort of equipment at the plant. 23rd Avenue, we have over 6,000. And at Cave Creek, we have over 1,500. So our, our, um, our renewal program, or our money that we have available to, um, to maintain all these assets on a 10-year basis from 2015 to 24 25 for 91st Avenue, we have 93.4 million. And while that might seem like a lot when you look at it on a yearly basis, if you, if you average that down to, to one year, that's $9.3 million per year for over 16,000 assets. At 23rd Avenue, it's 41.7, and at Cave Creek, it's 11.4 million. So now let's talk about some of our projects that we've either done or are preparing to do. So in the, um, you know what, let's start with the picture on the right, which is our bar screens, because that's actually where flow, when it comes into a wastewater plant, it comes through the bar screens. The bar screens are what um, bring out all, grab all the rags and the larger um, debris that comes in, and that's hauled off to the landfill. I know, probably not a great topic for after, <laughs> after lunch, sorry. <laughs> but um, one of these bar screens, these bar screens, um, what we've done recently is, is rehab the bar screens. So we've taken them completely out of the flow stream, um, um, brought the metal down to bare metal, recoded them, and put them back in the flow stream. And again, that, that buys us extra time before we actually have to go in and replace the entire screen. In the upper left-hand corner is a picture of our grit basins. So after the flow goes through the bar screens, then it goes to the grit basins, where a lot of the larger um, rocks and grit settle out in the grit basins. And the grit basin is actually underground, but you can see there's a curbing around it. And that curbing is, is kind of the concrete is spalling on that. So that's another area where um, we're going to go in and, and rehab that and extend the life of the, of the grit basin. And again, we're dealing with fairly harsh environment here. Um, you know, a lot of hydrogen sulfide, a lot of um, um, gases that come through. So, um, so that's part of the reason why a lot of this equipment needs to be maintained. So this is a picture of a before and after. And this is one of our sump pumps at 23rd Avenue. And the picture on the left is the before picture. Um, and you can see that the controls on it, it was more of just a, an on-off type control. Um, this sump, um, when it fills up, a, a float tells it it's time to turn the pump on, and, and then it, it pumps the, the area down. At times, that float would either um, not tell it to, that it needed to turn on, or it would uh, the controls are such that it wouldn't turn off. So when we upgraded it, we went to a different system, like the one on the right, which um, just has more bells and whistles, has some backups to it, so um, operates a little more efficiently. And you can see that we also, we, I mean, we kept this, a lot of the same piping in place. So again, it was just the controls that we were able to upgrade. All right, one of the next things is our digesters. And there's quite a few pictures here. We'll talk a lot about our digesters. That's one of the big, big, big ticket items at the plants. But this picture is digester valves. So at, um, at 91st Avenue, there's 16 digesters. And at 23rd Avenue, there's four digesters. And so we need to, to move flow from one to another or to, to um, close, open and close valves to get flow into certain digesters or take one out of service. So occasionally those valves, although we exercise them, they need to be replaced. So in the top left-hand picture is a picture of our, our older valves. And in the bottom right-hand picture, again, a lot of the same piping. And we just were able to replace the, the valve, which is in blue. All right, this is one of my... So it's one of my favorite pictures only because it shows some of the age of some of our equipment. So the picture on the left is um, our digester temperature control system that we currently have still at 23rd Avenue. I think it may be from the 20s. It may be the original equipment out there. Um, 
So anyway, with the digesters, we need to keep the digesters at a constant temperature of about 96 degrees. And so our temperature control system is what tells um, our hot water pumps on the right when to when we need to heat up the digested sludge or when it needs to not be quite as hot. So um, we do have a project that's underway soon to upgrade our digester temperature control panel. And um, the picture on the right is our um, hot water circulating pumps, and we've replaced some of those. Uh -huh. How do you heat and or cool the water? It's more heating. Um, we don't really cool it. Um, so it, it, it passes by a heat exchanger, so we basically heat up hot water and then run the, the sludge by, that, by a heat exchanger with hot water. The other thing that's interesting to note, the boilers that heat the water, we use digester gas. So we're not buying utility gas. We're reusing the gas that's naturally produced to heat the water. Do we um, get rec renewable energy credits for that? We get what? Do we count? So we use digester gas, which is later on we're talking about a related topic. Okay. But are we capturing renewable energy credits for those? I don't believe, sorry. I can ask later if this is the wrong person. I think no, I, maybe I will ask later. I don't believe that we are getting energy credits for those at okay. this time. Because we do have a renewable energy standard and we're not quite there. So maybe that's something yep. we can talk and, about. And we can, we can look into that and, and give you a report back. Okay, so again, still on the, um, on the topic of digesters. So these are our, these are our digesters at, tw at 91st Avenue. And we're in a process right now of we went through and evaluated all the digester domes, so the lids on them. And we're, we're replacing them about one digester dome at a time. Our digesters, just to give you some perspective, they're 90 to 150 feet in diameter. And they're about 40 feet tall. So they're pretty massive structures. And they're anywhere from one and a half to five million gallon in capacity. So what we did on this is we're replacing, like I said, we're replacing the digester dome. And you can see on the picture on the bottom left-hand corner how it looks like there are different little pie pieces on the, on the roof. So, and you can see that there's like a, a ridge on each one of those pie pieces. Our, um, the existing digester dome, so the older ones, had those pie pieces almost on the inside. Well, they were on the inside. So there was like a flange on, or a seam down the inside. And what we found is that that was where a lot of the corrosion was starting, was at this seam. So our new ones that we're putting in, we're putting them in kind of the other way with the seam on the top. And by doing that, we're able to have a smooth coating on the inside. So there's less area for moisture and for hazardous gases to get up in the, in the digester dome portion. This is one of the walls of one of the digesters. So again, we're trying to extend the life, bring it back to, to a like new condition. And we found that there were some areas, like in the picture on the left, where from moisture running down the side of the digester over the years, it's kind of gotten back in behind the, in the cracks in the digester and even gotten back into the rebar and rusted some of the rebar. So what we're able to do is to cut out a whole area, expose the rebar, replace rebar or tie in some new where it needed to be, and then reconcrete over that. So we're keeping the existing structure. We're just repairing it and bringing it to, back to like new condition. So um, this picture on the left, kind of talk about, you know, we've been talking about a lot of equipment and a lot of the um, valves. And a lot of times it's not just the valves that need to be replaced. This picture, the valve is perfectly fine and operates well. It's the stand. So you can see towards the, um, the valve is kind of sitting on a little, on a stand, and that stand, the concrete is corroding out of the bottom of that stand. So that's one of these, one a, a project where we're going in and just, you know, replacing the, replacing the stand so that the whole piece doesn't uh, fall over and we don't need a whole new valve. <laughs> and the picture on the right is our, um, our aeration basin. So after the wastewater comes through our bar screens and grit basins, it goes into the aeration basin where we provide air to all the microorganisms and they do their thing and break down the wastewater. And we need to provide a very constant and consistent um, kind of flow mat of air. And so what we've got is, di is um, aeration domes. So each one of those little circles is a dome. It's about this big. And um, there's about 10,000 of those in every aeration basin. 
23rd Avenue has four aeration basins and 91st Avenue has eight. So that's, that's uh, quite a few of those little um, domes that need to be replaced. We replace them every three to five years. And again, we, re we really rely on a lot of our process staff to then to look and they, they can tell by how numbers are looking in their, in their computer system and how, how the treatment's being, um, how the process is working as for whether or not we need to replace those domes. So our next picture on the left is another picture, um, again, additional equipment. It's not just, like I said, it's not just the equipment, it's also the supporting equipment. So this is an air duct that was rusting out and we went in, kept the same HVAC system, kept the same air conditioning the whole bit and just were able to replace that air duct. And the picture on the right is a um, leaking reuse water line. This is somewhat what we strive for. We want to get to this line just before it um, completely gets to failure. So in this case, it was leaking. We we're able to go in, isolate it, find the leak, replace just the leaking piece, and the rest of the line is still usable. And one of our other programs then that we're doing is called Arc Flash. Now, just so we're all clear, none of these pictures are from our plant, so don't, don't get too excited yet. <laughs> um, but Arc Flash, an Arc Flash is when an electric current leaves its intended path, travels through the air. So it's, it's, um, it's really detrimental if you've got employees or anybody nearby. So every five years we need to do a whole Arc Flash study and so we need to delineate around our equipment where, how far away people need to be, what type of proper protective equipment they need to get close to it or to work on the equipment. So why are we doing all this and what is the end product? The end product is our effluent. So, and there's a lot of beneficial reuse that we're able to do. So um, a lot of our effluent is used for irrigation. We use it for crops in open areas. We can use it for golf courses. Um, there's water rights exchanges. Buckeye Irrigation District and Roosevelt Irrigation District take some of our effluent and use it. Palo Verde also takes a significant portion from our 91st Avenue plant, and they use it for their um, cooling for their cooling towers. And um, wetlands a portion of our project goes out, or our effluent goes out to our 91st Avenue Tres Rios wetland project. And there's a lot of birds and wildlife out there, and we're in the process of um, designing some hiking trails in the area, too. So in the picture in the bottom right-hand corner was a picture that I took out at 91st Avenue. Um, this was right outside our admin building. And so it's kind of one of those, if you build it, they will come. And there were um, a little family of owls. So it was kind of neat being able to go out there every day and watch the little owls grow up and fly the coop. <laughs> So that is our um, infrastructure renewal program. Are there any any questions? So you talked about arc flash, and I know OSHA updated the standards for at least some utilities. Did that impact us? You said every five years, but it seemed like I know it's every five years. I'm not sure if I I don't know if it was more frequent before then, but we're on a five year update, and there were update the NEMA. So when they update, we I update. Think. Yes. Yes, Perfect. we do. I should have asked that in a more yes. simple way. <laughs> Councilman? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Just um, interesting presentation. Thank you. On Trace Rios, mm -hmm. pleased to hear uh, you say that um, there's some hiking trails that are being done. I mean, I had the chance to go out there a few years ago, and I mean, it's just, uh, it's just a real gem. And uh, I don't know if there's been any uh, thought about, I mean, the... Uh, uh, the birds and you know different the wildlife out there could really be a pretty tremendous place for for the bird bird birders. I'm not a bird birders, birders. birders. I'm birders. not a birder but um, from what I understand it would be a great spot for that any looking at that I mean just one more thing for people to kind of drive people to to come here to the valley and and visit so. um, we do there are plans with in with the trace rails with the recreational recreational overlay it's called. There are some um, bird raptor towers that are going to be installed. Um, as of right now, we give birder permits. So if you are a birder watching counting birds, you can go out there and, and we'll give you a permit to be on the site. One thing to add is 
there, the final stage of the project is to build some entrances for the public, mm -hmm. and there's a restroom facility and a maintenance building. And there was funding through the core that we had some matching funds um, to finalize that final phase of the project. The core funding got removed and wasn't available for the project. So what we've done or what we're trying to do is we're working with the core to take our share back. There was some arts money in there as well, and it's mm -hmm. about 1.7 or 1.8 million. Yeah. Yeah. And if we can get that piece back, we're going to build a portion of the project. So we have at least a couple of entrances so that it's more open to the public. And then when the rest of the funding is available through the core, they can finish the remaining entrances to the project. And I would add, we had a really productive meeting last week with uh, folks from the LA District Office of the Corps of Engineers to talk about many things, including this. We're very encouraged about the time frame in which we're going to get that money back. And, uh, and they're also going to uh, transfer over to us their design for the, the last phase, the recreational facilities. So it's, it's coming along. It's almost done. Great. Thanks for that update. Anyone else have any questions? Was the funding loss related to sequestration? Our funding, Ron, you might want to add, our funding was a portion of what, what the Corps was going to use to build the facilities, and they have reached their limit, their appropriations limit, on what they can invest in the project. We don't know what the timing is to get that limit changed, and so in the meantime, they've agreed to give us the money back. Very good. Well, thank you very much. Very interesting. We'll go to uh, Odor. Do you get to do this one, too? <laughs> I have a stinky district, so I'm real interested yeah. oh. in this one. You have a what? Certain areas. Stinky do you also have an No, I don't. Okay. Um, Chairwoman yeah. Williams, members of the yeah, subcommittee, yeah. Um, we are now going to provide an update on odor control in our wastewater collection system. Um, we have just recently completed two studies that have been completed for two different areas of our system. Um, we do have odor control systems scattered throughout the city, and Patty will provide a brief overview of what we have. But we also get odor complaints. And when we get an odor complaint, we take them all very seriously. We go out and investigate them. And most of the time, we can resolve it by our normal maintenance activities, which is cleaning the sewer system, sealing manholes, doing things like that. But there are cases where that's not enough, and we have to do more. And what we also do with our odor complaints is we put them all on a map. And then as we map them throughout the year, we can see trends where what we normally do isn't enough to solve those problems. Um, the two areas that we studied were 39th Avenue and also the Southern Avenue interceptor and the sh uh, another Shrog interceptor that kind of goes along Lower Buckeye. Because those were the two areas that we've gotten a lot of complaints on in the normal maintenance just isn't isn't working. Um, and, and with that, I'll let Patty go through and describe the actual recommendations of the study. Okay. Thank you again. All right. So this is our um, odor control study. So just to give you a little bit of information on our, on our system, we have over 5,000 miles of sewer and over 94,000 manholes. And as we discussed previously in the previous presentation, 170 million gallons of wastewater treated every day. So that treated wastewater is collected through our, through our collection system. Um, it's natural biological activity as, it, as it's breaking down throughout the collection system. That is really what causes the odors in the system. So relating this back to our business plan, again, one of our goals is to provide excellent customer service. And we do this by building and maintaining good relationships with our customers and the community and providing excellent customer service. And responding to odor control issues is one way that we can provide excellent customer service. So what are the conditions that cause odors? So odors are caused by high temperatures, low oxygen levels. So as we enter the summer months here, our wastewater temperatures are not going to get any lower. They're going to continue to, to rise, which could cause additional, additional odor issues. 
slower wastewater velocity. So as the flow slows down, a lot of the solids settle out in the system, which again increases that biological activity, could uh, create more odors. And any sort of turns, bends, drops, anything that's creating turbulence could um, kick up odors and release them to the atmosphere. And one thing to note, too, is that the longer it takes for wastewater basically to get from its point of origin down to the plant, the, uh, the more biological activity that takes place. And a lot of, you know, as Ron pointed out, a lot of our interceptors start in far reaches of the valley and go all the way down to 91st Avenue. So there is a long detention time there. Some of our current odor control practices. Um, in the far left-hand corner, we do sewer cleaning. So we do regular cleaning of our sewers, again, to try and keep them clean. We do um, a grease management program. So we go out and meet with restaurants and, and customers and let them know the proper way to dispose of grease. Uh, again, if grease um, cakes on the inside of the sewer lines, it, it can create more activity, biological activity. We do manhole sealing. So we try and seal every little portion of the manhole so that those sewer gases can don't escape and remain in the sewer and um, go on down the sewer system. And we do chemical addition. So in the upper right-hand corner is chemical addition. And what the chemical addition does is it impedes the reaction, um, which creates the hydrogen sulfide gas, which are some of the, the gases that create the odors. And so there are two, two methods. You can either do um, a liquid treatment, which is like chemical addition, or you can do an air treatment. So you can treat the foul air. So the picture in the bottom right-hand corners are, are air treatment. You can either do some sort of chemical scrubber treatment or the picture in the far right-hand corner is a biofilter, which has below that rock area is a media, which is a biological media. So the air goes through the media and then uh, gets treated as it's going through the media and before it's released. So we do have 30 odor control locations where we're either um, injecting chemicals or we have air treatment. So the um, purple bluish dots are chemical treatment sites and the yellow dots are air treatment. We have 15 standalone um, chemical addition sites and then we have six that are located at lift stations. And we have um, about nine air phase, which is either some sort of biofilter or um, air scrubber carbon, carbon system. So as Ron said, we've got, we initiated two studies, one along 39th Avenue. <laughs> I know that you're, <laughs> you're very interested in that one, huh? Yeah. So the 39th <laughs> Avenue interceptor study. And then we also did a combined a study on the Salt River Outfall, SRO, and Southern Avenue interceptor of the SAI. And those are both Shrog owned. So um, Shrog owns a portion of the SRO, SAI. So we have our partners of Glendale, Mesa, Scottsdale, and Tempe. So first, a little bit about our 39th Avenue study. So 39th Avenue study, it, it starts, 39th Avenue interceptor starts around Pinnacle Peak and travels south down to Lower Buckeye Road. It basically follows the 39th Avenue alignment. It's about 20 miles long, and the uh, diameters along that, along that interceptor range from 36 to 66 inches. And you can see on the, on the figure, we've um, circled some of the hot spots where we've received more complaints, so those were focus areas in this study. I should say, too, that the flow down 39th Avenue is probably about 30 million gallons a day. So a little bit about um, what was actually evaluated. We looked at physical pipeline characteristics. So were there any bends, drops, turns, um, siphons went under the ACDC canal? So there's areas where, where odors, where we could have additional odors. Um, the study did a fan did fan testing. So the picture in the bottom right hand corner is a, a picture of the fan testing. And the best way to describe fan testing is that we a, a large fan is hooked up to the interceptor si system. Now the interceptor system also has other contributors coming in. So you know if you can imagine a main line and you've got other contributors coming in. So what the fan system does is look at if you if you put a Basically, it's like sucking air through a straw. How far reaching is that? Um, are we going to be able to, to get air out of that system? So if we wanted to treat air in the 39th Avenue interceptor and we put this fan system on, how far upstream would it go? 
and we found that it was over a mile that based on the, the size span that they used that we could treat air from over a mile out of the system. Is that in both directions? Up um, and it's down? a little less downstream because upstream you've got the flow coming with you right. bringing, the, bringing the air with it. And then, um, oh, we also did two chemicals. We did a full, full test of two chemicals. And so we varied the chemicals to see which one was most effective. And then we also varied the concentrations to see, um, again, which concentration was most effective and, and at what concentrations did it reach furthest downstream. And then there's a break point where when you add more chemicals, it's really not getting you any additional treatment. So the field work for this study is done, and the recommendation is to go with a ferrous chloride chemical addition at 47th Avenue and Pinnacle Peak. And we are confident that we can have that in place by the end of this year. So we're going to start design and, and get that site converted to, we have, a, we have a location already picked out, the facility that we own, that we could get that set up with ferrous chloride addition. And then what we're gonna do is a phased approach. So after we get that system set up, um, see how that does in terms of odor treatment, but then also look at some sort of air extraction unit like a carbon absorption system and look at putting that further downstream. So maybe at the ACDC canal um, just south of Peoria or even down at um, Bethany or both if we, if we find that both are needed. Any questions on that? Now we're moving to the next one. <laughs> Looking at Thelda. <laughs> I'm fine. The things Councilwoman Williams yeah. does for her constituents. Yeah. <laughs> if they so only then, knew. Yeah. <laughs> so then the, uh, um, the next study that we did was on the SRO SAI system. <coughs> and um, this system, the SRO, is along the north. It's the, um, the purple line to the north. And it starts at around Tempe Town Lake. It goes 23 miles in length. The, um, the diameter of the SRO is anywhere between 51 and 90 inches in diameter, so a very large interceptor. The SAI is along the south, starts around Priest and Southern, it's about 20 miles, and it ranges from 48 to 72 inches in diameter. It crosses the um, Salt River at about 51st Avenue and joins up with the um, SRO at 59th Avenue. And you can see again, we've got circles where the where the odor control hots or the odor complaint hot spots were. <coughs> and again, on this study, it was it was fairly similar. We again evaluated the pipeline characteristics, looked to see where there were bends and siphons and anything that was causing turbulence. Um, we did we took wastewater and air samples, and again we were looking at air pressure samples. So similar to the fan test, we were looking at pressure samples to see if how much air was wanting to, to basically be released from the sewer system. And we did a bench scale chemical evaluation of four different chemicals. So and in this study, again, this study is, is in its completion stage and we're reviewing the, the draft document. And again, even with this study, we're gonna do a phased approach. So right now we're currently adding chemicals to the SAI. And the plan is to evaluate, to continue adding chemicals to the SAI, but then to evaluate a bio tower with carbon polishing and um, see how this does on the interceptor. It's not something that, that we have in place currently. We don't have a, a bio tower on our, on our interceptor anywhere. And so the plan would be to select one location, possibly downstream where the SRO SAI came together and put a bio tower down in that area and evaluate its performance. If that works well, we'll expand it up to the, to the upstream portions also. That's all. Any questions on odor control? Are you going to bring back a report probably in six months or so and tell us what the effect was from your efforts? Uh-huh, we can. Okay. So, well, we're, well, I guess the first thing we'll do is, is go to, um, at 39th Avenue, put the ferrous chloride online Good, because I'm meeting with him in about three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so you can tell them that should be online by the end of the year. And you're going to bring me some information I could take and try to repeat what you just said. Well, hopefully they will no thank, one asks the question. They, <laughs> hopefully they will thank you for uh, reducing the odors, right? I hope so. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, we're putting a document together for you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? 
on the southern. So the treatment, if you started at sort of a le letter, lesser populated area where you were considering starting, then some of the corridor along southern where there's just more people living, is that just because we don't know if technically it will work or? Well, let me try to explain that. So. And I, I did not completely catch what a bio tower was. Yeah, so if me, understanding yeah. that is important, that is a missing link for me. Let me try to explain that. So historically, when we're scrubbing air, what we've typically used are chemical scrubbers. And chemical scrubbers are the more traditional way of treating for odors. Um, but what the newer technology is more going to a bio type system. And one of the pictures that Patty talked about was a bio filter. And that's kind of a lot smaller scale. It's to treat odors at a lift station. So what happens is you have a bacteria in this media that you need to keep it under the right conditions. And then the air that goes through it, the, the smelly contaminants in the air, the, the biological activity mm -hmm. kind of eats it. And, and then it cleans it up before it goes out. And they're a lot cheaper to operate. And they're obviously more environmental friendly. So we have some experience with that. And what the consultant recommended for the southern um, interceptor is a bio tower. And a bio tower is a huge 40, 50 foot tower that has, it has similar kind of biological media in it to treat the odors. And we haven't actually had, we don't have Phoenix have experience with that type of system. Um, we have checked, there's others like LA has a big bio tower, but it's at a, a wastewater treatment plant. And we are not sure if they have them at other collection systems. So we need to do our due diligence and, and see what we can do. Um, if we're satisfied with the technology, we, we want to try one and make sure that it actually works in this situation. And then the reason that, that we're looking at the more western end of Southern is because we're, we're treating the upper end with chemicals. So we're doing a liquid injection. and we changed that chemical about two years ago from the chemical that we used to have wasn't as long acting. We went to a longer acting chemical. So we're able to get control further down Southern. But then at 51st Avenue, um, the pipe has to cross the Salt River to get to the wastewater treatment plant. So it goes underground under the river. And when it does that, there's not an air gap in the pipe. And normally the, the gas in the sewer goes along with the flow but then it's cut off because there's no air gap. So what's happening is pressure is building up in that pipe and it's making it more difficult upstream to control odor. So we think if we are able to pull that gas out of the pipe there, it'll help upstream as well. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, next is, uh, I think John, John here. Uh, Landfill gas to energy efforts. And I believe you asked for this, Councilman Gates? I believe so. <laughs> Madam Chair, uh, members of the subcommittee, thank you. Um, today we're here to talk, give you an update and if what progress we've had on our landfill gas to energy efforts. I have with me uh, Chuck Hamster here today with me. He's our Deputy Director of Disposal. And just in case if you had any technical questions related to carbon dioxide, methane, all that stuff, he can answer that question for you. So let me start by um, talking a little bit about requirements needed to, to make a, a landfill gas to energy project viable. So mainly, we, when we, we've worked with several companies, and they're looking anywhere from 40 to 50% methane content uh, for a, that will last for up to 10 years or longer. They're also looking to see if they have long-term power purchase agreements. And so do you need to have both of those really to have a viable project to moving forward? We, we've had some, I'll talk a little bit about some projects we have had both and it still didn't work out. So I'll, I'll explain a little bit why that didn't work out. But just to give you an idea of the, the five closed landfills and the one closed landfill, which is SR85. As you can see on, on the chart there, our Deer Valley landfill has been closed for, for greater than 43 years. We are still flaring methane at that site, still. And so, and our, our Skunk Creek landfill, you can see it's, it's pretty high, and we've been flaring that for about 
under 10 years at this time. So we are still collecting methane. We still have environmental controls at each of those sites, and it does cost money. We're doing everything we can to make sure we have the right size flare with the amount of methane that's being produced at that site. And the previous efforts, we've had some previous to this, some uh, Cambrian Energy, if I don't know if you remember that name, but we've had some where they've maintained our, our gas collection system for over 30 years, and they were supposed to be doing a, a gas to energy project at that time, and that never went, and they went away. The last one that we did was our Skunk Creek landfill. We had the methane content, we had the gas, we had the power purchase agreement. The, the problem with that one is the company could not get a, a agreement with APS to wheel that energy to California. So that, after that didn't happen, it just fell through. And so they went away. And it was Amoresco. And we, we had a contract everything ready to go, the study, and it just didn't work. We did, so we, uh, with, if you remember, if you look at the slide here, SR85, we have well, a 50% methane uh, being created at that site right now, and it's going up. Not only the, the, the uh, methane, but the, the amount of methane that's being uh, generated at that site. So we did a, and a study at SR85 landfill to figure out a way, what can we do at that site? Whether it's um, creating um, waste energy, working with APS now that we have a solar project going on down there. Um, but, and we, we looked at cleaning the gas and creating either CNG or putting it back into the pipeline. The, the problem that, that we're having in, in with that is, is these issues right here. Right now, natural gas is at its lowest at this time, and so that's creating that return on investment that we would normally have on higher gas prices. Right now, utilities, they don't need additional alternative energy projects, so we've tried working with APS as an example to see could we include our gas to energy project along with their solar project, and right now it's just not something that they're interested in. There, there is some high capital investments, it, it, anywhere from 10 to 15 million, depending on the type of project that you choose. And, and with our other closed landfills, because of the decreasing in, in the methane content as well as the amount of gas that's being generated, it's getting harder and harder to create a, a project that does return on your investment. And when you decrease tonnage, as an example, we're looking at diversion at SRA landfill. In the future, methane will, will peak at some point and start coming down. Right now, it, it's still on the upward side of the curve. And in a way, it's good. Methane is not a good gas to be producing. And right now, we're, we're burning it, which creates that carbon dioxide, which is not a good thing as well. And so it's something we're, we're working on as we're moving forward. But on the flip side, we are looking at, at some other efforts. What can we do? And so as part of our call for innovators, we're looking at if there's any other technologies out there that we can take waste energy projects as and we could possibly use some landfill gas, which is located there at our 23rd Avenue site. There's a landfill there that we are producing some methane. So we could, could we combine this process and gas that's being produced there uh, as, to pr produce a product? A lot of, there are a lot of companies that are looking for that carbon. And a Sprint, as an example, takes that carbon and strips it and creates your covers for your cell phones, mm -hmm. as an example. So they are creating a product from that carbon. So there, there is a business case that it can be used. Our friends' water creates lots of methane, and so there could be opportunities in, in partnering with them if we can make a feasible project to move forward on for our property as well to, to capture that as well. And so as you can see, we are trying to move forward with our efforts to, to use, utilize either waste or landfill gas and see uh, the outcome of this process. We're all, go ahead. I was just gonna add, Mad Madam Chair and uh, subcommittee members, that one thing great is that the water, uh, water services, the 23rd Avenue wastewater plant is located very close to the 27th Avenue landfill. So should there be an interest, it's a lot easier, particularly at that location, 
to get the landfill gas and the and the um, digester gas uh, feeding into the, a, a similar project. We've actually tried to to do that and we're unable to to do it. And and maybe at some point in the future, the Water Services Department want to give an update on, on some of their efforts in this, this area as well. Um, the other thing I want to mention is when we did the initial solar contract at the um, SR85 landfill, that also included uh, digester, I mean, not digester, landfill gas to energy and was a big, that was one of the reasons why we had so many proposers for that project. They were as interested or more interested in the landfill gas than they were in the, uh, in the solar, but our current solar project doesn't include that. And the reason they were interested, as you know, is the landfill life at SR85 landfill. We have over 100 years of life available, land available for landfill purposes. And so that's going to be creating and developing methane at that site for, for many, many, many years to come. As you can see in our older landfills, the ones that were opened in the early 60s are still producing methane at this time over 50 years later. So these landfills, they, you know, they did, that methane is still going to be there and it's still going to be creating that gas uh, for in the future as well. And, and it, as we mentioned earlier, it is increasing because we are continuously adding material to that site. Um, we're hoping what, well, the goal is to decrease that. It's what our goal is in the future because we're going to take less organic material as we're trying to capture that organics material, as you heard from last week on our presentation, and, and to do something with it other than burying and creating this, this gas that we're capturing at the time. And again, this, these gas collection systems aren't cheap. You know, we, we, every, at S35 landfill, for every lift, we put in a horizontal system and then eventually we put a vertical system as well. So we have blowers and flares and control systems that you saw in water. We have those control systems that's out there as well that is capturing this material and as well as maintaining the system. So it's not cheap you know, when we're, as we're managing this, this gas system at each of those different sites. That's all I have. Yes, um, Madam Chair, thanks for the presentation and thanks for your efforts. We've been talking about this for years. Um, mm -hmm. You know, obviously we've we've had great success as a city with getting solar on city property and city facilities, but unfortunately this one has just, uh, we just haven't, haven't gotten there yet. So on the uh, call for innovators, you mentioned that and then you kind of talked about 23rd, but is that at all, does that include uh, SR85? Does the CFI include that as well, or is it just 23rd Avenue? Madam Chair, uh, Councilman Gates, it's just 23rd Avenue. Okay. So why um, why haven't we done at least that as it relates to SR85? I mean, I understand the general um, barriers, but maybe if you can talk a little bit about why we haven't at least done an RFP or CFI or something for SR85. Um, the reason being because we know the utilities aren't interested in landfill, in, to landfill gas to energy. In order to get a project to work, you have to have this power purchase agreement to do that. And you have two utilities here locally. So right now, we're still going to be pursuing it. We're still, APS said that's not their priority right now, but it doesn't mean the doors are closed. So there could be some future opportunities. We do have some ideas that we've looked at. Could we create our own microgrid on site? We do have a, a manufacturing process that is leasing um, a facility from us. So could we create our own microgrid grid on site and provide power to that site as well as to ours as well? So we're looking at different options and to see if that's something we can do in the future as well and see what the feasibility is of, of doing that type of a project. And then maybe if you can just talk a little bit about um, any opportunities that might exist to, because we know in California, they have higher renewable standards in the possibility of generate. I mean, clearly we've reached a point given, you know, the efforts of our, the aggressive efforts of our utilities here to reach those renewable goals. Mm -hmm. What about that possibility of generating electricity to be sent to California? 
We've tried that once, and you still have to deal with the utilities to get it there. And that's where it fell through this last time as well. So we had an agreement, or Amoresco had an agreement with a California group. They were going to purchase that from us, but we couldn't get it to them. And that, that's what became the issue. And the, and the original contract with, I'm not going to remember the name of the company now, that was going to build a huge solar plant there. They also, their, their plan was to wheel um, to California as well, mm -hmm. but they, they couldn't get the, uh, the agreements. And, and they were finding, they made the choice, although eventually they had other issues, but they made the choice to pursue a California plant instead of, of doing it here and having the longer transmission distance. Um, as far as the CFI then at 23rd is, uh, I mean, do you have any concept of what the size of that might be from a, from a megawatt perspective? Or an aspiration, or what? I mean, just to give me an idea. Well, it, it, it probably about a one megawatt. It could be a combination of, of of waste and landfill gas, is what we're looking at for on site. And we're trying to figure out could we create our own microgrid on that site as well yeah. if we bring in manufacturers and businesses too. So yeah, because that you're not thinking that there would be an off taker for that, are you? Well, we're hoping that the businesses we develop on site there will be right, the but not but not the utility, just no. the same issue that yeah. we have at SR eighty five. Yes, exactly. So there's um, just kind of a better business case for the microgrid there than there is at SR eighty five. And so we, is that kind of how you landed there? Yeah, and we did bring that subject up to APS, and they said that they would like to sit down and talk about that concept as well. So don't know what could come of that, but. It's something that they pique their interest to. Madam Chair, Councilman Gates, one thing we do have going for us here is that utilities do prefer to have diverse sources. So, you know, it's not just well, you know, how big is the alternative energy bucket. It also, if it is diverse, it's helpful to them. As you know, solar only functions during certain right. uh, periods. And so that, you know, the fact that you have another source or another approach is a good strategy generally for uh, providing reliability and so we think there'll be interest eventually in this but right now it's just it ha hadn't been there and like we had a couple of close uh, opportunities but they just didn't materialize all right well thank you again i'll continue to push for this i'm encouraged by the cfi look forward to you know hearing a report on that uh, because I think it is, you know, uh, Councilman Gallego mentioned the uh, renewable uh, energy goals that we want to reach. And then once we get to the point where it looks like we're going to reach them, then we want to push it and, mm -hmm. and set it higher. So we need to continue to put things in the pipeline, bad pun, to, uh, you know, to, to allow us to reach these, these goals. So um, what's the timeline on the, on the CFI? The uh, proposals, we will be receiving them on April 14th. And hopefully before summer break, we will be awarding uh, some businesses for that pilot RFP process. And then we're hoping in the fall to, to put out an economic development uh, solicitation uh, as an RFP uh, based on the, the answers we receive on the CFI. Okay, great. Well, Madam Chair, thanks for putting this on the agenda. I think it's a something that we should continue to push forward on as a, as a city. I agree. Are there any further questions? Okay, hearing none, thank you, John. Thank you. Thank, and thank you. you. And we look forward to coming back and briefing us on their progress. Okay, this time we do get there Catherine. Go, yeah. <laughs> Colorado River. Good afternoon again, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm realizing that I've neglected to introduce myself. <laughs> I'm introducing others. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I should have done that. <laughs> I am Karen Peters, Senior Executive Assistant to the City Manager, and very pleased today to get to talk in some more detail about the Colorado 
River Resiliency Program, a, a very cutting edge and exciting aspect of our CIP. And with that, Catherine Sorensen, our Water Services Director, will walk us through it. Good afternoon, Madam. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, uh, Council Members. Yeah, I, I don't come up here every time because I feel like you guys see a lot of me and, and probably just need a break from time to time. So, um, but happy to be here to talk about the Colorado River. Um, actually, Cliff is going to start us off. He's going to talk a little bit about current drought conditions and where we are, which is um, interestingly enough in terms of the Colorado River, the projections are, I think, one percentage point better than where we were about this time last year. But that doesn't mean good. So. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Cliff Neal, Water Resources Advisor. Uh, you've seen this map before. We, I think we, it's, a, it's now become a uh, tradition that we start our talks off with this map. Uh, unfortunately, the map is not really getting any better than, than it was uh, originally. As you can see, um, it shows that there is still exceptional, quote, exceptional drought in California. In Arizona, we're still in the moderate, some severe drought areas in Arizona, but maybe the more important part is uh, up in Colorado, Utah, Wyoming. Um, that's the real watershed that serves our Colorado River supplies. And fortunately, Wyoming's not in drought, but uh, part of Colorado and, and most of Utah is still in a, at least a moderate drought. So um, as Catherine indicated, things have picked up a little bit from last year, but it's still, we're still not over the hump and we've still got a long ways to go. Um, so what we're facing then is, is a potential formal declaration by the Secretary of the Interior of a Colorado River shortage to the lower basin. Um, for 2016, the probability is, is about one in five. For 2017, it's a little over a 50-50 chance. That's based on uh, the elevations in Lake Mead. It's a, it's a strict, formulaic method of determining whether there's a shortage or not. When they do their analysis or projections of, of supplies on the river, if there's projected to be a lake meet elevation of 1075 above, uh, 1075 feet or below, that would dictate that there has to be a shortage. Um, and that, that 1075 is based on January 1 proje projections. So um, what we're seeing then is uh, the chance for shortages coming is, is getting larger and larger. This would, these, these percentages represent a tier one shortage that would have no impact on the city of Phoenix's water supplies. In fact, even projecting years down the road, if, if the drought continues and, and the reservoir elevation keeps dropping, uh, there's still years until we would actually see an impact on our Colorado River water supplies. Um, so we're in pretty good shape with that. Uh, and also keep in mind the fact that we still only use about two thirds of our, of our Colorado River supplies. So even if there was an impact, a, a shortage on M&I Colorado River supplies, we still have some buffer in there as well. So we're in pretty good shape. Problem is that there, if there is a, a formally declared shortage, that's going to create uncertainty. The media is going to going to um, see it. They're going to think, "Oh, that means you know we're all in trouble." Uh, so we're certainly going to have to face uh, face that. We're going to have to um, be able to answer or provide answers. Um, a tier one shortage does result in reductions in deliveries to the agricultural community uh, in the CAP system, and in turn, then that will reduce the CAP's operation costs stay the same, but the volume of water they deliver will go down, so that would end up in an increase in our water rates for the water that we do have. So um, just a couple of things to keep in mind as, uh, as what, what might happen if a shortage is actually declared. Yeah, kick it back to Kathy. <laughs> yes, and so we've talked about this before, but really the fundamental problem is that the Colorado River system itself is not resilient. And I, I like to compare and contrast it with the Salt River Project system, which, which is a fairly resi resilient system. One of the big differences between the two systems is that with the Salt River Project, you have a local governance with a local board that can control allocations to protect the levels in the reservoir. And SRP has done that um, back in, I believe it was the year 2003, when the drought was getting you know, really, really bad. It's bad now, but it was even worse then. Um, the, the board did vote to reduce allocations and protect the reservoirs for, for future years. The Colorado River system governance is much more complex than that. We're not talking about a local board that can act unilaterally. We're talking about international treaties, Supreme Court cases, interstate compacts. It's just far more complex. To add to that then, the Colorado River system itself is over allocated. We know that. There's a lot of publicity about that. 
And then it's governed in a, through a system in which if there's a drop of water available, it's allocated out to somebody to use. And so all of us on the Colorado River, we live on this continu continual razor's edge where instead of building resiliency for the future, we're using everything that's available to us every single year. So there's no easy way to protect for the future. So what we did, as um, you all are well aware, to respond to this um, is we adopted the Colorado River Resiliency Program last fall. Um, and that's for us to have some resources to draw from to go out and pursue resiliency efforts. And um, we're programming that at, um, on average, it comes close to $6 million a year in the five-year CIP. And it's important to keep in mind and that, and there's a reason that we talk about different um, levels of resiliency within the Colorado River system. So the, the system itself is not resilient. Um, there are things that we can do to start talking about resiliency at that system level. There are things we can do to talk about resiliency at, a, at more of a regional level. And for example, our agreement with the city of Tucson was one of our um, calls to action on, on that level. And then there's things that we can do here locally just as the city. So we focus on these three different levels as we talk about Colorado River system resiliency. So system-wide, one of the things that we were able to accomplish this year, and Cliff really did a great job of working out this arrangement with um, the Central Arizona Water Conservation District. So we were actually able to facilitate an agreement through which 15,000 acre feet of water was um, stored and kept behind Lake Mead um, or in Lake Mead behind the reservoir to protect against future shortages. It's a little bit complicated. I'll do my best to explain it. But basically, um, SRP and the CAWCD had um, exchanged some water between their two systems about 10 years ago. And what that meant is that the CAWCD had credit to some of the water behind um, Roosevelt Dam. Last fall, the city of Phoenix had ordered 15,000 acre feet of Colorado River water to be brought through the system and then stored in local aquifers um, here uh, with the Salt, in partnership with the Salt River Project. So what Cliff figured out and was able to facilitate is that we could leave that 15,000 acre feet of Colorado River water on the river itself behind Lake Mead and then have the CWCD use its credits behind Lake Roosevelt and bring those down and store in local aquifers instead. The city of Phoenix was basically made whole through this. We paid the same amount of money that we expected to pay to create those credits, those long-term storage credits, and to store that water. So the water that um, was saved and is now up behind um, in Lake Mead doesn't have the city of Phoenix's name on it. We just facilitated the agreement. But we think it was a really important step in the right direction. And we're hoping to be able to um, come to that same arrangement next year with the Central Arizona Project as well. So that was a big step forward for us. Um, we are also continuing to have conversations about an expanded system conservation program. And what this would be is a, a program where more water is left on the Colorado River itself to prop up those reservoir levels. So we get away from this paradigm of saying, if there's a, if there's a drop available, it goes and belongs to someone and someone uses it. Instead, you enter into a paradigm where there's some water that just belongs to the system and it stays on the river for the benefit of the system and, and to stabilize the system. So we continue to have those conversations. Those will be long-term conversations because that, that is a fairly complicated um, effort, but we continue in that direction. Um, okay, then moving on to more of the regional Colorado River res resiliency things that we're doing. Um, Catherine mentioned the Phoenix-Tucson uh, partnership, uh, which we partnered with the city of Tucson as well as Metropolitan Metropolitan Domestic Water Improvement District, which is a, a water provider down in the Tucson area. Um, under that program, I won't belabor it because I think you're probably well aware of it, but um, we are storing some of our unused Colorado River water down in those aquifers down in Tucson. Um, we'll leave it there until we, until we see a shortage coming on the Colorado River, and at that time, those folks will pump, will pump that water out and use it and leave Colorado River water that they would have otherwise used in the CAP system where we'll take it at our treatment plants. It, it um, <clears throat> kind of leverages infrastructure that they have with water resources that we have, save co saves costs for both entities, and it also provides uh, resiliency for, um, 
for our Colorado River's supplies going forward. Um, local resiliency then, uh, a couple things that we are working on and plan to keep working on, continue to aquifer recharge. We um, plan on storing another 10 to 20,000 acre feet per year in local aquifers of our excess water, uh, excess Colorado River water supplies going forward. Um, so that'll help uh, help bolster that account so in the event of a shortage in the future, we can call on that. We're also expanding our aquifer storage and recovery well program. Those are wells that we're actually drilling in our service area um, and we are treating water and injecting it down into the aquifer so that in the future when we need water, it'll be right there where our pumps are. We can just reverse those pumps, pull it back out and put it into our system. That also, uh, that also provides um, annual operating flexibility that we, that's useful to us as well. So it, it's, it's a dual benefit kind of a thing, but um, it's a very important component of our, of our resiliency efforts. Uh, enhanced aquifer management, this is a, a, an item that we discussed with you in October. Uh, one of the concerns that we have is that we are going to be needing our groundwater at some point in the future, probably the distant future, but we want to make sure that it's safe. We want to make sure that it isn't uh, pulled out by somebody else. So we've been working with uh, other folks in the, in the um, municipal area here in Phoenix to try to come up with some um, mechanisms that would protect the groundwater supplies that are in place as well as, as recharge that we do. One of the concerns that we have is that under the current state laws, uh, an entity can recharge in one area and then pump it back out in a completely different area. The, the, it's, it's perfectly legal. It meets the assured water supply rules of the state, but it, it does create or it can create some physical availability problems going forward in the future. So we want to try to address that. And we've been working with folks on that. Now, Finally, me. one of the uh, another of the things that we're doing. Yes. Oh, I'm Does that sorry. require the legislature to take action or is, can that be a city agreement amongst the different cities? Councilwoman Williams. Yes. Uh, okay. So it, I, I would say I, we're looking at all options. So there, there are some options that would require changes to state law um, because for the most part, the state has control over the, the pumping of groundwater. But we are looking at what we could do locally or even through intergovernmental agreement with other entities. So it, we're pursuing all options. Thank you. Um, groundwater modeling, then, that's another uh, effort that we're embarking on. We have modeled the groundwater in our in our service area and, and in the Phoenix Active Management Area in the past. We are uh, improving our modeling efforts by expanding the recharge component of the of the model so that we can get a, a little more realistic, a little better picture of what's going to happen in the future uh, in the event that we do start relying on, on more on groundwater under a shortage type of a scenario. And not just us, but as but the other cities in the surrounding area to the extent they start relying more on groundwater. We want to see how that's going to impact us and then um, make decisions of what we might do as far as uh, infrastructure and that type of thing going forward with respect to that. I, I'm not a trusting soul, so I had them bring in where, uh, a map that showed where all the aquifers were and where each city was dapped in <laughs> and where we were storing to see. So it's very interesting. It's very complex. Fortunately, physically, City of Phoenix is in, in very good shape because mm -hmm. we're kind of in the middle of the basin. Mm -hmm. the, the real problem that, uh, that we've seen based on modeling that the state has done, modeling that we have done, is on, on the fringe areas close to the mountains. Um, so from a physical perspective, we're in pretty good shape. The problem is, is that as those fringe areas start seeing groundwater um, impacts, the state starts making different rules and different, <laughs> different things that could impact the City of Phoenix. So that's what we're trying to uh, stay ahead of. Yeah, and Councilman Williams, I would add too, you know, Arizona is ahead of the game, um, especially compared to California right now, because we did undertake very comprehensive groundwater management reform. And the whole idea was to save those supplies for the future um, and then be able to rely on them. What we hoped at the time was decades from now, it may turn out to be sooner than we all thought, but that groundwater management, we've made leaps and strides, but we don't, we want to continue to improve and, and certainly prevent um, falling back into poor groundwater management strategies. Wait, when you're talking about the Colorado River and you're talking about storing the water either at Mead or underground, you're purchasing the water and then storing it. I mean, we're not talking free water flowing through that we're not paying for. Is that correct? Councilman Williams, correct. I wish it were, well, yes, that is correct. I wish it were free. It's not. But yes, we purchase it, we bring it into the system, and we, and we store it. So it's yes. like putting money in the bank, 
Right. And we just hope nobody robs the bank in the meantime or changes the rules right. and tries to tap into what we have said. Is that correct? Councilman Williams, correct. Okay. Very well said. Thank okay. you. Go ahead. So how do we protect ourselves? I mean, what do we need to do to be proactive in protecting ourselves? Has she heard of the NRA? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so one of the things, so Councilwoman Williams, Councilwoman Pastor, it, it, is, it is very complicated. There are well spacing rules that are governed through the state. So it is relatively difficult to drill a well and impact someone else's well. So for example, one of the things that we do is make sure that we have, that our wells are where they need to be and then protest if someone tries to come in and drill a well too closely to ours and impact ours. Um, the other thing that we do is work very closely with the other cities here in the Valley. We talk about these issues at length and, and talk about how we can better manage the aquifer as a whole together. Some of the groundwater modelings have been um, undertaken collaboratively with the cities. We also work very closely with the State Department of Water Resources. This, this is their thing. The State Department of Water Resources really came out of the 1980 Groundwater Management Act that's the entity that's leading us towards the goal of safe yield in the year 2025. Um, but there are, there are some improvements that we would like to see, and, and Cliff mentioned one of them. We, we would like to see a better nexus between where water is um, pumped and where it is taken back out of the aquifer so that one individual or a group of individuals are not allowed to create externalities that affect others in, in basically the same aquifer. Um, it's, so it's, I guess to answer your question, it's, it's a little bit of um, joint modeling. It's a little bit of um, some IGAs. Um, and it's a little bit of um, trying to nudge state law in the right direction. Thank you. OK, so uh, at, a, at a local level, uh, we also talked with you last fall about um, watershed protection. And the reason that, that this is important to us is whatever watersheds we have, we want them to be as healthy and productive as possible. And one of the lessons that Western water utilities have learned, I, I will say a little late, we're all a little late to the game, is that um, it's very important to protect your watersheds, especially against catastrophic wildfire, because the consequences of that catastrophic wildfire can really be very, very um, high, um, very costly for us. Um, th these are lessons that Santa Fe, Albuquerque, Denver Water, Phoenix, Aurora, um, others across the West have all directly experienced. So um, when there's a catastrophic wildfire due to having too many trees um, and, and the fire suppression that took place over the past century, what happens is the, um, the ton of sediments and ash come down into the watersheds and then they enter the water supply and that's been really problematic for us. You've seen um, Assistant Director Troy Hayes come up here and talk to you about turbidity, the dreaded T word. Um, the city of Phoenix itself had, uh, has spent around $25 million uh, upgrading our water treatment plants to react to these types of problems. So although we're coming a little late to the game, we want to still come to the game and be proactive and start to de dedicate some efforts towards prevention um, as opposed to reacting to problems. Um, we have invested a lot of money to upgrade our systems. We feel like we're in a, in, a, in a good place as far as managing turbidity events in our water treatment plants, but that's not to say that we're immune from continued problems. And I can tell you that every time it rains on the Tano watershed, um, Troy and I spend um, the weekend texting each other back and forth. We, um, we send employees immediately up on the watershed to start getting grab samples of what the water quality is coming down to the plants. And we spend many nervous days trying to figure out what our reaction is going to be and how we're going to be able to continue to supply our customers with water. So we're in a good place, but we just want to be sure that moving forward, we're even more protective of our water supplies and that we're moving in the right direction towards prevention, not reaction. So um, we are also uh, hopeful that to participate in some of these water, watershed restoration programs. One in particular that we're looking at right now is a partnership through um, the National Forest Foundation. Um, it's the Northern Arizona Forest Fund. We're looking at participating at a level of about $200,000 on two particular projects, one on the Oak Creek watershed um, and one on the uh, Beaver Creek. They're both on the Verde. Um, these are forest thinning projects. They are, um, 
their projects to prevent sediment erosion caused by roads and, and, and other problems within the watershed. So we would like very much to participate in those efforts as well to make sure that what watersheds we have are as productive as possible. Okay, and that's all we had prepared. We're happy to take any questions. Any questions? Have them. Councilman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Not really a question, just a comment. Thank you um, for the great Catherine and your team uh, of late, I mean, have really been leading on these issues. And there's been a, you know, it's a time of some transition, I guess, at the state level. And so I just appreciate so much the leadership that you all have shown on these issues and the innovation. And I'm particularly excited about the forest thinning. Um, I think it's very important use of some of these Colorado, although technically it's not on Colorado River, but these, the resiliency fund because of the fact that, you know, it could uh, lead to fewer of the wildfires. I mean, you look at the statistics are just overwhelming on how these wildfires continue to increase in, in number and in, in size. So if we can help to, uh, you know, start to get that going in the in the opposite direction plus avoiding the immediate impact that uh, this has both from the Tibert, uh, uh, I'm it's been a long day already we got started <laughs> yeah. turbidity sorry the turbidity issues but then also the this possibility which I guess is kind of speculation that if you thin out these forests then that means that there's going to be more water because they're not using as much water. So it's yeah. more water that comes down here. So that's exciting. And again, I know that's there needs to be more scientific research on that. But for those reasons, then the the emphasis that our um, you know congressional delegation and in particular Senator Flake, but I think others have, it's a great partnership. So I am uh, wholeheartedly in support of this, and uh, and uh, hope we'll have an opportunity maybe to vote on something here in the in the near future. So. Thanks again for the presentation. Thank you very much. Excellent job. Oh, oh. Councilor? Could you speak a little bit to groundwater levels in the Phoenix area? Sure. Uh, Councilwoman Williams, uh, Councilwoman Gallego. Yes, so groundwater levels in the Phoenix AMA, for the most part, have either stabilized or rebounded. Um, really, uh, so here, and Cliff is correct, we're, we're fortunate to be kind of in the center of the aquifer itself. So groundwater levels here tend to be um, better than at the fringe of the aquifer. That's really where you start to see the first disturbances. But at the fringe of the aquifer, we have already seen those declines in the groundwater levels. And the concern is that those, as, um, as more and more water is pulled from the aquifer, it creates ever expanding cones of depression that then have the ability to impact um, people within that that cone. So um, while groundwater levels have generally rebounded here, what we want to do is be very protective of those levels. And also it's important to keep in mind that a lot of the reason why groundwater levels have rebounded is because people have been storing water. Um, that's something that the city of Phoenix has not done a lot of in the past. It's done some, but that's something as part of our resiliency efforts that we want to do much more of in the future. So um, we want to protect that water that gets stored. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the reason for the rebound is exactly that stored water. Mm -hmm. And you talked about our resiliency efforts. And then Councilman Gates alluded to that there's a resiliency effort on the Salton Verde. But the fund we created, we said only for Colorado. And his comment made me question. Right. Councilman Williams, Councilwoman Gallego. Yes, it, it's an excellent question. And I wanted to address that. So part of our resiliency on the Colorado River is the fact that we do have the salt and verde available to us. So mm -hmm. as we experience um, the increased chances of shortage on the Colorado River, we're fortunate to have the salt river system to fall back on. So part of our strategy for resilience on the Colorado River is to make sure that the salt and verde are also resilient and healthy. So I really see them as um, very intertwined. Okay. Also keep in mind that um, although most of the water that we're entitled to on the uh, Salt River system comes through the Salt River Valley Water Users Association, the city of Phoenix also has its own rights to Verde water and to Salt River water that we've set up over time. We have rights to horseshoe water and um, new conservation space. So some of it is salt, is technically Salt River water, but some of it, or Salt River project water, but some of it is just in our name. And that's really what we can rely on as Colorado River levels decline. So we want to protect both. 
But the two hundred thousand dollars does it come from the Colorado River Resiliency Councilwoman Williams, bucket? Councilwoman Geiger? It, it does. Um, yeah, no, it does because again, we see them as as intertwined as part of a greater resiliency effort. And then you spoke about wanting to do more groundwater projects in this local area. Mm -hmm. So we talked about stormwater management last time. And just to, to recap that a little bit, a groundwater or a right, water right is created when it's channelized. Uh, Councilman Williams, Councilman Gallego, yes, that's correct. Uh -huh. So um, the way that the laws in the state are structured, um, water is appropriable once it hits the, the, the stream itself. That's when it becomes appropriable. Mm -hmm. um, so, but we have concerns with um, additional use of stormwater. So le let me put it this way. What we want to do is encourage additional use of stormwater on property, so within property boundaries. That's rel that is... Um, it's smart, it's efficient, it's, um, it makes all the sense in the world to invest in that type of green infrastructure. But there are some issues and concerns with trying to go off of property boundaries and try to move stormwater from place to place, if that makes sense. Am I but answering if it's in question? a large basin and it stays in that large basin. That's fabulous, we love that. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> so I think that's something I would just continue like to be part of this conversation, and I thank Councilman Gates for bringing that up. Yes. Um, on the expanded system conservation program, you talked about more water staying in the river. What were some of the sources that we're thinking, or if you commit to a source, could we know about it first? Um, Councilwoman Williams, Councilwoman Gallego, yes. So I think that's a really open question, and, and um, I'll answer it as best I can. Please understand that system conservation really has to take place between all seven basin states at some level, or at least in the near future between the three lower basin states. So um, the Phoenix cannot unilaterally leave water on the river and then expect it to stay there. It takes the agreement of the, at least the lower basin for that to take place. Um, there is a pilot program in place uh, through the Central Arizona Project, uh, the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, the Southern Nevada Water Authority, and the Bureau of Reclamation. In Denver water. Um, and this pilot program, they're, they're releasing um, a call for proposals to, to answer exactly your question. What kind of water is available out there? Where is it going to come from? How could it be saved? And, and how could we keep it on the river? So we don't know the answer to that yet. Phoenix's portion, what we've been able to come up with so far, um, thanks to Cliff, is this idea of trading some of the credits in um, Roosevelt Lake for some of the water in the Colorado and keeping the water on the Colorado. So that, that will stay as system conservation, or no, I'm sorry, that will become intentionally created surplus water. But that will stay um, on the Colorado River. Let me answer that more concisely. We don't know yet. We're, we're, we're still exploring that and trying to figure out exactly what water this is going to be. And it, it will take a very large partnership effort. Fabulous. I think that's just one where some of us would love to be involved early. I think there are some areas like wastewater odor management where it's maybe better if we're involved at the end because we maybe don't have <laughs> the technical expertise. No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, did Councilman Gage just volunteer to lead that committee? Yeah, yeah that's all right. <laughs> that, yeah. But this is one where I think we'd rather know earlier than later, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Councilwoman Williams, Councilwoman Gallego, absolutely. Um, and obviously these issues become very sensitive very mm -hmm. quickly, especially to local communities that might be affected. And so we would anticipate always bringing those back as soon as we know what they are and what the opportunities are um, for the council to be able to weigh in on that. Wonderful, thank you. Absolutely. Um, uh, not, not questions, more comments. There's been an effort uh, by a foundation in Colorado that is uh, wanting to organize within the Phoenix area about conservation of the Colorado River uh, water supply, in particular in the Latino community. So my question is, what are we doing now to educate um, those within our community to start conserving water or ways of preserving water? And do we really need to start looking at bigger efforts so that long range planning, uh, we are able to survive when others aren't able to or uh, will be moving here knowing that there is water? Mm -hmm. And so what is our long-term goal in the sense of educating our community? 
Um, Councilwoman Williams, Councilwoman Pastor. So I'm going to take the, the first stab at that, and then I'm going to have Brandy. I knew there was a reason Brandy was sitting up here. I'm going to have her talk to you specifically about our very extensive conservation programs. And April is Water Awareness Month. So excellent time for that question. So happy April. <laughs> so um, in the broad perspective, what I would say is that the city of Phoenix, um, so going back 20 years now, um, the city of Phoenix has had a very active water conservation program, and our long-term focus has been on helping our customers embrace a desert lifestyle. And that is what we continue to educate our customers towards. Give them the tools and the resources and the, um, you know, the pamphlets at the nurseries, the, the tools at their fingertips to know what it is to embrace a desert lifestyle. That is very focused on landscaping and on um, efficient fixtures in our homes. So that's where we're gonna get the best bang for our buck. But we want customers to move here and understand that um, embracing a desert lifestyle, it, it's not about making difficult choices. It's about accepting that the desert is a really beautiful place and that if you embrace it, you can have beautiful landscaping and a very high quality of life. So that's been our long-term goal is to, is to help people understand that, especially because a lot of people move here from other parts of the country and they, they just don't know how beautiful it is. So long-term, that's been our focus. But I will let uh, Brandy, and that will continue to be our, our focus, um, but I will let Brandy talk to you um, about some of the particulars about our education and outreach programs. Thank you. Um, so we have a variety of things we work on. Uh, we do a lot of community outreach at different events. We go over, um, to over 40 to 60 events a year, and we basically do that with only one person. So sometimes when Melrose on 7th is having something at the same time, SRP is having something. Um, we're deploying people out to those um, to hand out different pamphlets, mostly on the landscape, as, as Catherine mentioned. We also have um, an extensive school program, um, and we've been working with the PAC program after school, and we've been um, going and educating children, because we do feel that if you're a a child and they love to learn and they they're very interested in water and how it works you start at that level they teach their parents sometimes their grandparents um, and they start to really live the life of, of living in the desert um, so we work with the PAC program and we also have several schools that reach out to us at different times of the year especially like the fourth through sixth grade that have water curriculum within um, the the school system they'll reach out to us we'll we'll have presentations at the school materials we hand out those type of things we've also recently started working um, with the parks department and some of the other departments in um, what they're calling this university um, curriculum type thing and we're actually have several events where we've been um, to the South Mountain Community College um, and the high school and different things where we have open sessions where any of the public can come and learn about landscaping, about water and different events. And so we have those now happening um, pretty much monthly. And one of the things we've really focused on recently is getting that out um, on our media uh, through both our, our face, um, Facebook and Twitter and those type of things to try to get that message out there that these programs are happening um, and come see what it's all about and, and learn a little bit. And I would add that those uh, materials are also available in Spanish as well. Um, last, and just to, to wrap up that, that question, I hope, uh, we don't want our customers to think that they have to save water because there's a crisis. We want our customers to save water because they live in the desert and it's a beautiful place. So that, that's really the focus of our education and outreach. Well, I kind of, I kind of look at it as um, very much as we were studying the recycling uh, piece uh, a couple days ago or last week, that um, in order for people to really change behaviors and habits, uh, I look at it as another way of incentivizing uh, people to, uh, to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really about changing habits and behaviors. It's, it, as a teacher, you can teach students, kids, adults, have all the information there, but until it hits them in a way that, uh, or any of us, in a way that uh, we need to look at, look at ourselves and our behaviors, then that's when we change. And so it's, it's more of a looking at a broader 
bigger picture of how do we start changing people's behaviors mm -hmm. so that we can conserve uh, water and still live the, the lifestyle we want to live. Um, and, and I just look at it, I think about all the pools that we have in, this, in, our, in our city and, and during the summer how we fill up our pools and, and there's just a number of things to really start conscientiously thinking mm -hmm. for the future. Um, so that's, that's just kind of where I was think going. You know, one of the things I think shows that you've done an excellent job is the water usage. Mm, yeah. And the fact that we use the same we did in the 80s, I believe, per person. Councilman Williams, yes, that's correct. So uh, we, in the last approximately 20 years, we're losing, we are using approximately 30% less. We're using less in total as a city than we did in 1996. So um, our, our long-term view, our, our, um, our education efforts towards helping our customers embrace that desert lifestyle, it, it seems to be working. And we fully expect that we'll continue to work. Our projections do indicate, um, and, and we forecast, that those GPCD numbers will continue to go down. One, one of the benefits from AMWA mm -hmm. is uh, their conservation program. And weekly, uh, they send out multiple notices, information, mm -hmm. blogs, emails. Uh, they have all kinds of pamphlets, English and Spanish, how to fix leaks uh, that are available to be distributed. And I, I'm assuming that you get those and then you put them out to your list and we keep the momentum going uh, because they do, they really have a person just sitting there doing that all the time and uh, getting a great response. So, any well, other questions? You. Pardon? I said thank you. Oh. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Are there any future items that you want to? Uh, but we won't have another meeting this month, I promise. We you just sure? Met, 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 met. <laughs> We've got all More solved. meetings next month. <laughs> Hearing none, then uh, we are adjourned. And I am so proud of that.